Uh, markers in schizophrenia can be useful for several purposes. In general, I think that they can be helpful to inform clinical decision making beyond what we can do just with clinical information. Currently, we depend on whatever the patient tells us, and based on that, we make clinical decisions. However, we still do a lot that's based on trial and error. For instance, um, we don't know whether a given individual is going to develop a side effect. We don't know whether a given individual is going to respond to a particular medication. We don't generally know whether someone's going to be safe if they stop treatment, et cetera. These are important clinical questions that we now treat by trial and error. So uh, biomarkers could be helpful if they inform our clinical decision-making beyond what we can currently do so that we prevent trial and error and we try to go for targeted interventions for a given individual. For instance, they could be helpful if we know that someone is not going to respond to a non closed antipsychotic, then we could uh, provide close-up into that patient earlier on. Or if we think that someone is at high risk of the developing uh, weight gain with a particular medication, then we could prevent, the, you know, we could use something else. We could also determine whether for someone it is uh, a good idea or a bad idea in terms of uh, relapse risk to stop taking a medication, et cetera. These are all important clinical questions that currently we answer by trial and error and that we could uh, answer instead by having uh, informed decision making with biomarkers. In general, biomarker development is a relatively new field and there are some areas in medicine for which it's more developed than in others, for instance, in cancer, treatment is more developed. So there are treatments that are decided for a given individual based on genetic markers, and that's already occurring. So that's an example of the potential of biomarkers in medicine. However, not all areas in medicine as are, are as developed. In particular, in psychiatry, there are several challenges that make it a little bit more difficult. So I think that that's the reason why psychiatry is maybe lagging behind some other fields. And to me, there are two reasons why that why it's this is much more challenging. One is that uh, the brain is a highly complex organ, and it's not just the brain, it's also the environment. And there are many things that are very difficult to measure, uh, variables that are highly important, but we can just not measure. So that's one one layer of complication. And the other is the fact that we rely on on interviews and which which can be subjective and maybe not as reliable as an objective marker, such as uh, whether you have a particular gene, et cetera. So these are uh, reasons why it is lagging behind other fields. However, I think that important progress is happening and, and I'm optimistic. So to bring biomarkers to the clinic, several steps need to take place. People may be familiar with the steps that need to take place before a drug is brought to the market. Initially, the drug needs to engage a receptor, and then you need to demonstrate that it's safe, that it engages the receptor in vivo, and then you have to demonstrate that it has clinical efficacy. So you can think about biomarker development uh, with a similar framework in which initially we identify targets. And by targets, I mean that you have a question that's actionable, that you have a biological process that you can measure, and also that you have a measurement tool that is scalable to the clinic. There are some measurement tools that are uh, obviously very important for, uh, for neuroscience, but that will be difficult to bring to the clinic. For instance, PET imaging is highly informative, but it's difficult to roll out to the clinic. So once you have that triad, you should move to internal validation. You should demonstrate that within your sample, you're able to make predictions of who's going to be a responder or not responder, or, or who's going to relapse or not relapse, et cetera, based on your measure. And you should make sure that that's not mediated by confounding. A common confounding is motion artifacts in resting state fMRI, for example. So in that case, you want to make sure that your analyses have accounted for that, potential confounding and that you're really seeing a genuine uh, 
relationship between the biomarker and the clinical uh, measure, the clinical outcome. The third step is external validation, and that is to demonstrate that not just you can make predictions in the sample in which you developed your biomarker, but that you can make predictions actually in unseen individuals. And this is really important because we are going to use the biomarker in clinical populations that have not participated in research and that we do, don't have so much, so much information on. They may be different in terms of age or any other um, sociodemographic or clinical characteristics. So it's important to demonstrate you can make predictions in unseen data sets. And finally, you have to demonstrate that those predictions are clinically useful. Uh, the question is, is biomarker measurement, measurement um, I'm sorry, biomarker-based care better than treatment as usual? Is uh, treatment choice based on a particular measure from a biomarker superior in terms of clinical outcomes of interest, patient satisfaction, relapse uh, rates, uh, et cetera? Is that better to treatment as usual? So that's the litmus, litmus test that needs to be passed in order to really bring biomarkers to the clinic. There are uh, different biomarkers, obviously, for, for psychiatry and for schizophrenia in particular, and there are at different stages of development based on the framework that I just described. There, we conducted a systematic review about this, which was recently published, and we found that there were two biomarkers that were at the stage three, meaning that they had evidence for external validation. One was the striatal connectivity index, uh, which is a measure of treatment response. The other one was the FSA, the um, functional striatal abnormalities. That is a measure that classifies patients uh, from controls. And we found that uh, each each uh, data each measure has different um, degrees of of external validation, but by and large they do have. Uh, you know, there are reasons to believe that actually those measures can work in out of sample. One important aspect of biomarker development is that it should be hypothesis driven, and that's much more likely not just to function in within sample predictions, but also out of sample predictions. If it's informed by by what we already know, um, that mediates the pathophysiology of illness. We know that stridal function is critical in schizophrenia. There's a, there are decades of literature that, um, that, that, you know, that say so, and, and we, we know quite a bit about with stridal function. So that's why they focus on, on this. The biomarkers that have been most successful so far have focused on stridal function. Now I'm going to explain this figure in a little bit more detail. So here you can see on panel A, the basis of resting state functional MRI, which is the technique that was used to develop the SKI, the stradal connectivity index, and the FSA, the functional stradal abnormalities. Resting state fMRI essentially is a movie of brain activity over time. So what we obtain for each region of interest for voxels all over the brain, we obtain time courses, which essentially show how the ball signal fluctuates over time. The ball signal being a measure of in, uh, indirect measure of neuronal activity. And then if there is high overlap between the time courses from two given regions, you can say that those two regions are uh, functionally connected. If there is low overlap between two time courses, you can say, that there is low or uh, low functional connectivity. So as an example here, the connectivity between the blue and the yellow box is greater, meaning that there is more overlap between the two time courses than between each one of those two uh, boxes and the green box. So that's the principle for uh, functional connectivity. And then you can use that measure to then analyze it further and develop clinically useful biomarkers. First, I'll start with the SKI, so I'll explain briefly what the authors did here. The SKI, Stradial Connectivity Index, is a measure based on functional MRI. Uh, 
in which the investigators took regions of interest within the stratum, and then they looked at the correlation between the time course in those stratal seats and regions in other places of the brain in the cortex. And then that's what's called a, a connectivity map. What they did then is to see whether there was there were connections that were predictive of treatment response, whether uh, across individuals, regions that tended to be highly functionally connected tended to predict uh, response and, and so forth. And then doing that, they identified 91 connections that were predictive of treatment response. In the second step of the investigation, the authors took a completely unseen data set and they calculated the SKI, which again is a measure that summarizes the functional connectivity for those 91 connectivity uh, for those 91 couplets. And that number that they obtained for each brain scan was uh, used uh, to classify patients from controls and actually they, uh, I'm sorry, to classify responders from non responders. And then they actually saw that in this unseen data, the the skis that were calculated from uh, scans actually were highly predictive of trim response with a, an accuracy of over 80%. Now, moving to the FSA, the functional stratal abnormalities, the authors used a different approach. This is based on machine learning. They did three types of analyses to the resting state fMRI. The first analysis was FALF, which is uh, an analysis that essentially um, informs about the spontaneous activity in a given region, and here they focus on the stratum. The next step of analysis that they conducted was intrastratal functional connectivity, meaning the functional connectivity within regions in the stratum. And third, they looked at extrastratal functional connectivity, meaning the, um, the connectivity, functional connectivity be between the stratum and the cortex. They used those three types of analyses to feed a machine learning model that then was trained to classify patients from controls. And they did a sort of an, an analysis that's called leaf one side out cross validation. They conducted this in 1100 individuals from seven data sets, and they would develop their model in six of those data sets and, and validate in, in one that was not used for the development. And so, and they did that repeating uh, all, you know, all over each uh, clinic and doing that, which is a robust method of cross validation, they found that they there was an accuracy of over eighty percent. So, which is which is quite impressive. In a systematic review of the state of the field, we found that the SKI and the FSA were the biomarkers that were uh, most advanced in in the development process, meaning that. They had robust internal validation, and also they had reasonable external validation. So, in the case of the ski, the authors developed the measure in one data set, but then they tested it on an unseen data set, and actually the predictions were quite good. Similarly, for the FSA, there was not exactly a, a validation in in a completely unseen data, but they used the leaf one site out cross validation, which which is pretty close, and essentially is that the model is developed in uh, in part of the data, and then you use part of the data that wasn't used for development to validate. And so that's why um, we concluded that those two were the most developed biomarkers. Uh, other biomarkers we we reviewed were not quite as advanced. The next steps in this field of research is first to uh, further externally validate um, this measurement. So we need to to test these biomarkers uh, in larger data sets, completely unseen, testing also the effects that the scanner brand, uh, acquisition parameters, clinical uh, and demographic characteristics have on on this biomarker. So we need to understand really well how how they work. We need to see whether, um, they work well across the entirety, the entire range of um, of risk, or whether they work better for low risk than high risk populations, etc. So we need to develop a little bit more the validation aspect of these biomarkers. And you know, I think that once that's achieved, it's important to move to clinical trials to demonstrate whether uh, 
this is better than usual care. So I think that that's the, st the state of, of the art. For further information, see the article, a roadmap to bring neuroimaging biomarkers for schizophrenia to the clinic on the Neurotorium website.